And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Suzanne Worthley, energy healing practitioner, intuitive, and psychic empath for more than two decades. She teaches about consciousness studies and energy work and is the author of Confident Empath, a complete guide to multidimensional empathing and energy protection. Suzanne, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Suzanne, if you don't mind, let's start with how you became an empath and go from there. Oh, okay, that's that's fair, I guess, because like, why are you writing this? I have been, I think, psychically connected since day one. Uh, when I was six years old, I had alien heads on my ceiling and they telepathically worked with me and talked to me. And I intuitively would understand them and had the concept in my mind that everybody did this until I found out they didn't. And I was very challenged at that time with a blood disease. And I was very, very connected in the feel centers and the tele telepathic centers since day one. And after that time period, I kind of put uh, my connection with the galactics away a little bit because I did find out, you know, when you were getting to be that young child and that middle school child, nobody else was seeing what I saw. And so I kind of tampered that down and put it away. But um, I was always extremely intuitive and very feeling. And I didn't understand what an empath was because back then that wasn't even a word. And now it's kind of a buzzword. And so as my career moved into being a healer, I began to really excel my skill set and then train myself to be a full body empath, which means I can 100% merge with you. It, when I have permission, I 100% merge with you and I feel everything within you and I get signs and signals and information. And then I completely pull out of that experience and then I cut my cords. So this is why I kind of like got into this subject because it can be very, very dangerous and it can be really detrimental to your health if you don't know what you're doing. I had no idea that you were going to go there about aliens, but do you <laughs> think that aliens somehow changed you? into having this ability of being an empath? Yeah, that's a great question. And I full heartedly believe that, um, you know, listeners can take what resonates, obviously toss what doesn't. But at six years old, I fully trusted those beings on my ceiling 100%. And I did not trust the Western medical world because it didn't feel right in my body. And when I was having this blood disease that no one could understand or figure out, and I was going in at six and seven years old every week for blood draws, I could astrally project out of my body and go into other places to listen to conversations that they were having about me. And it was just this normal experience for me. And I would hear the alien heads say, we're working on your blood. We're changing your blood. We're working on your body and your blood. And so that was, yeah, a really, really clear connection for me. Do you think that they were fixing you or more experimenting on you? I don't think they were experimenting because I know for a fact that I was aligned here for a mission because that's another message I got at 10, that you are here on a mission and will activate you when it's time. Um, but I do know that at the same time when the so-called good alien heads were on my ceiling some nights, there was other nights where there were the not so good alien heads and these did not look the same. They did not feel the same. And that was the nefarious agenda that was trying to shut my blood down. And this happens a lot, Jeff, to star seeds. As far as I understand that a lot of us star seeds when we're children will have traumatic things with our health and wellness at about that age seven to be either shut down or activated. And I think both was happening for me at that time. Would you say that you are a star seed and previous to this incarnation, you were a member of this alien group that was at your ceiling? I definitely um, resonate to the word star seed. Again, this is kind of like a really common word right now, sort of tossed around. But I have known until that word came about in the last, what, four or five years, I didn't have a name for it, but I definitely had all of the starseed qualities, you know, the loneliness, the weird, wondering why I'm not at home, I don't fit in, my body doesn't fit, I don't know why I'm wearing this suit, all of those things. Um, and I just had a really lonely existence with that, even though I had a huge, gigantic, super close family, right? So it's a disconnect for the starseed. And I'm the only one, by the way, in my family of six siblings. And so it was very um, kind of cool when it sort of came more popular and mainstream in the last couple of years. 
to be able to go, oh gosh, I'm not the only one that feels like this, right? I mean, so I definitely know that I came in as a starseed to do the mission work that I did do and still do. And so whether I'm part of those triad or not, I believe that that actually represents the Trinity of God source, the father God, the mother God, the child God. And I I just resonate to the architecture of that a lot when I work. And so being a part of it, we're all a part of it. But yeah, I do. I feel like that's part of who I am. So what star system are you from? That's what people usually say. Oh, are you Palladian? Oh, are you this? Are you that? I don't resonate to any because I even go higher than that in terms of my understanding and memory base. I go to essence. I just go to essence. But I do have a fractal of me that I'm very aware of that is very high in the Galactic Federation, and we dubbed him the general. And I've had many, many encounters going on ship and, and being in front of the Federation and having electric war memories, et cetera. So I, I can feel the essence of the general when that comes through. So that's a comfortable fractal of me, but it is not my soul essence. It's just a fractal. The soul essence is more, goes way up the chain in creational reality in terms of like the Melchizedek, the information, the teaching, the structure, the architecture, that's kind of where I resonate to. Are you aware of your purpose in this incarnation? And if so, what is it? Yes, I was told that my mission would start when it was time. It was activated in my 30s. I was a quote unquote normal mom being a corporate executive raising a ton of kids. And I walked out my back door just thinking it was a normal day. And I encountered my husband coming out from the garage and blurted out, oh my God, if you don't figure out your medicines, you're going to die because I can see in your body and it's all goofed up and you're all black. And he looked at me like I was nuts. And I looked at me like I was nuts, like what just came out of my mouth? And I sat there again and said, I can see inside your body. So that's how quickly I came online. And that was really tough. And so I did not learn the mission work until probably 12 years into the healing work. So the mission work that I ended up doing is a lot to do with the holographic blueprints of putting us back online in terms of putting not only humans, but the whole architecture back online to its original blueprint. And I did a lot of work in the grids for that. Did Almost you, nine years, nine years. <laughs> did something happen the night before this event happened, like in your sleep or your dreams? Like, is there some event that you can recognize that created or started this activation? Yeah, absolutely not. I wish there would have been like this, oh my God, this thing happened. So I could have had some context, right? Mm -hmm. But absolutely not. I was, like I said, thought I was just this normal executive with four kids and, you know, raising half of the neighborhood and being the Girl Scout mom or the, you know, the hockey mom, the this, the field trip mom. And then boom, I could see inside of people's bodies. And then all of a sudden there was dead people everywhere and there was aliens. It was a lot. It was oh. a lot. Mm. And so it's really difficult for a star seed, especially 20 years ago, to have that kind of a thrown into the fire introduction to this without anyone to, there wasn't podcasts. Yeah. There wasn't books. Empath was not a word. So I didn't understand how I could go into a building and feel things and know things and see things. There was just such confusion. Well, how has being an empath benefited your professional life? When I do the work that I do, I trained myself to be a confident empath. I literally worked and worked and worked at it. I would go up to my cabin. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember this. There's a, um, a TV series and book series called The Magic School Bus. Vaguely. I don't it was think... like a, sci a science class and they all would go on a bus and sometimes the kid would accidentally eat the bus and then it would go through the digestive tract and they'd learn. Okay. It was a cute little concept. I would play magic school, school bus with myself because I don't know anything about anatomy and I would go out to my cabin and I would envision if I had a school bus full of kids going through my esophageal tract, wondering what that felt like or what that looked like. And I would play that for hours and hours. So I became extremely intimate with my own frequency, my own vibration, my own boundary, my own aura. And I would press in and out of each of my auric fields. So I would practice and practice for hours upon hours. And I became extremely gifted in terms of this is mine, this isn't mine. And so I share some of those tactics in this book because not everybody has to be a full-blown professional psychic empath, but we're all empathing. So there are bits and pieces of that training that any person can do to benefit their health. Just so we're all on the same page, 
What is your definition of an empath? Thanks for asking that because a lot of people actually don't know the difference between having empathy and being an empath. And this is part of the mission of getting this information out. Our birthright as a human being is to have empathy. We are designed to feel what another feels. We are designed to feel pain, loss, support. But that is standing in somebody's shoes. I can stand in your shoes. I can feel your pain. I can know it, but I don't take it. I stand in your shoes. I don't take it. An empath not only stands in your shoes, but steals your shoes, runs away with your shoes and keeps your shoes and makes your shoes my shoes so that your sickness, your pain, your worry, et cetera, becomes mine. And we do this for a number of reasons, mostly based in, by the way, learned belief systems. And so we will take that energy as a robbing to fulfill our needs. And we always run out of it, hence the word psychic vampire or energy vampire, because we'll need another hit and another hit as the day goes on. If someone's on the fence about whether they're an empath or not, what are some signs and symptoms of being one? That's a really good question. And one of the biggest signs is you're the worrier. You're the one that's there for everybody. Everybody comes up to you and talks to you in the grocery store and tells you their problems. You're the one in the family that takes care of everything and everyone. Everyone else comes first. I have lists for my lists for my lists and I never can make it through my day. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I actually have hidden resentment that I don't even acknowledge because I'm always doing for others and no one's doing for me, but I don't let them do it for me because I can do it better anyway. And on and on it goes. So these are some of the really pretty typical signs. And I was almost every one of those. <laughs> are there different types of empaths? Yeah. And I, I break that down in the book. So in my opinion, there's the three. The general empath is basically most humans on this planet in terms of every human body is designed, like I said, to empathically feel. So we will feel overwhelm, frustration, a fight in the room, whatever. We'll feel all of that. But a general empath will basically move that through their field more organically so they won't hold it and it won't eventually dis-ease the system. The second category, however, gets deeper. This is called the sensitive empath. This is generally speaking what most of my clients are. These are the people that feel and really feel everybody's stuff and they worry. And oh my gosh, I have to, oh my God, you're so sick. I feel so bad for you. Oh my goodness, what can I do? I got to do something. That rumination, that really going deep into it because their senses get involved and they're the ones that suck it in like a sponge and it becomes their energy. The third category is what I am, which is called a, a psychic sensitive empath. So the psychic empath not only empaths from this third dimensional frame, but from everywhere. So I can pick it up from buildings. I can pick it up from the cosmos. I can pick it up from dead people. I can pick it up from objects. I can pick it up from everything. And I can pick it up from multiple timelines and the collective. So this one gets really, really tough for people. And a lot of people don't even know they're an empath, much less that they're a psychic empath, right? Can another person's energy or energy pattern transfer to you? And if so, can that be dangerous? That's exactly what the empath does. So the way that I explain it in the book is that we, the human, is a vehicle of source energy because source, the God source, whatever God package you have for your own belief system is yours. But source energy doesn't have a body. It's a design intelligence that doesn't have a body. We are an embodiment of that. And we chose to be a human one. So our human embodiment is like a vehicle of source energy and a vehicle in order to run and make it through a day needs gas. And our gas is chi, prana, life force, consciousness. This is the connection to source energy and it comes into our energetic template and body via our chakra system. Our chakras are akin to when you go to the gas station and you take that little cap off and you put the, the gas in and you squeeze. So life force is coming into those chakra centers just like that. This is how we run our body in fuel. And there's only two kinds of fuel, fear and love. Most empaths, unbeknownst to them, are running in fear fuel. And this, again, goes back to belief systems, okay? And then thirdly for the empath, the auric field, the aura, is akin to the gas tank. And if we've got a great car, great gas, but we got a crappy tank, it's going to spill out all over the ground and my parts are going to dis-ease. This is the detriment to the empath because my tank is not in secure, great shape. It has holes. I leak. 
I need gas because I have none. And so I will go into someone else's field and I will suck their energy out of it. And this crossing over of the two auric fields is what we call energy transference. And that is detrimental because I'll get like a Red Bull hit, like, yeah, that feels great. And then I go, boom. And then I need it again. This is why we call it vampiring. All right. So I'm a little bit confused. Are you drawing the energy out of other people or are they drawing it out of you? Actually, that's a really great thing to point out. So thank you. It actually goes both ways. So if I am the energy vampire that is really controlling or I'm just the worrier or I'm so worried about you, I'm going to go into your field because I'm over dominating you even by worry or control or manipulation or gaslighting. So I'm the dominant coming in, but you as the receiver also has a weak field or it can't happen. So I'm actually allowing and sucking back and forth. So transference is almost codependent. And mm -hmm. oftentimes empaths will find themselves in really codependent relationships because it's just constant transference. And it's an outside way to validate fuel and it's all fear-based. And so when we turn this around and we start realizing boundaries are actually a loving thing. Boundaries are really putting myself first in a beautiful, loving way, not selfish. So it changes everything when we start to understand the beliefs behind this. Well, when you start talking about vampirism and all this fear, it makes me wonder why somebody would want to be an empath. I love being an empath because I get to, I think, experience the world 10 times more. And it doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me cool. It, it, it's difficult. <laughs> okay. But for my work, it's perfect because I fully embody my clients and I scan them and I move their energy because I can monitor their energy through my body. And then I just cut those cords and I'm released. But in a day, Suzanne can also not be an energy practitioner. I can be super, super aware. I can walk into a woods and know the elementals are really hopping in here. I can walk into a building and go, oh my God, there's five ghosts in here. I can walk through a land and say, gosh, there was some native tragedy here. So I'm privy to so much more information. So it's a gift. It truly is a gift to be an empath as long as you know how to move the information out of the system. Right. And I would assume also if you're able to protect yourself from exactly someone vampiring your energy. And this comes by boundaries and work on that and discernment. Discernment, asking, is this mine? If this isn't mine, what is this? Whose is this? It's constant presence. So the biggest gift, Jeff, of being an empath is oneness. We can start to understand, I can have compassion for you. I can even have compassion for a tree. We were chatting before we started that Minnesota just got hit with some big storms and trees are down. I can feel the pain of a tree. So being that empath, I can go and I can work with that elemental deva of that tree and move that energy on behalf of that tree and send it back to source. I mean, it's, it's a gift to be able to do that. But I also, if I'm not trained, can feel the sadness of the tree. And if I don't have any context, I ruminate about that. And the normal human will want to make some sense of it. And by the end of the evening, I'm going to find something to be sad about, whether it's about my cat or my job or my partner, right? And it has nothing to do with the sad in the first place. So this is why this information is so critical, so that we have discernment. I have a feeling that a significant portion of the audience are empaths, and they may be either new to it or struggling with it. So what kind of tips can you give them? to protect themselves and be better empaths? The number one thing is to really understand your systems. But prior to that, let's jump to the first chapter of the book. The first chapter of the book is all about learned belief systems. So if we come from a family or society or a culture that says everybody else comes first, you might wanna re-examine that because when everybody else comes first, it puts a detriment to our energy field. I do service to others all day long, but there is an energetic service to self first so that I'm secured. I've got my gas tank in order. I've got a full tank and I can be able to give love freely. But if I'm on low fuel or no fuel, I'm going to be robbing that. So the belief systems are really critical to look at. How did I grow up? What was the messaging? What's the narrative I'm running? Do I have to worry because that makes me wonderful? 
You know, do I have to control because I'm scared? Do I feel like my life is victimization 24 seven? So these are the underpinnings of what's going on for most of the empaths. So that's a huge part of it. But going into what they can do without even really examining that, the very first thing is to start to understand your chakra system and your aura, grounding your body into the earth energy, understanding I have an auric bubble around me and being cognizant of that and aware of that, and then finding genuine fuel that is mine and divine to me, not stealing it. Now, you said that you can also sense things like ghosts. So to me, that means that you can use your ability across dimensions. Yes. And the discernment process is critical for someone to decide if there's a vibrational frequency that entered the room that is not mine. If I don't know Suzanne's frequency with a boundary in an intimate way, I won't know something entered the room or is in the room. I won't know that collision of frequencies. And so the better I am at discernment, I can walk into a room and immediately know there's three, if not five things in here that aren't my frequency. So this again is the tool to be able to go into those other realms. What is the best way to set boundaries? I, it is understanding that it is first and foremost, my job to look at my belief systems, change them if applicable. And again, take what resonates here. Number two, it's my job to fuel me. When I fuel me through you, if I'm going to worry, worry, worry about you, that depletes both of our fuels. But I think from the belief system that that makes me a great person because I'm worrying. And it really isn't. Okay. It's a, it's a lose, lose. And so look at those belief systems and understand that. And then I can pull that boundary and I can stop worrying about you. And I can honor the fact that you have a divine journey. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's losing your job. Maybe it is um, relationship problems. I don't have to be in the middle of your journey. I can honor your journey. That's the boundary. I can honor it. I can support it, but I don't go in and fix it. Mm. All right. Well, can you share one of the most amazing or extraordinary experiences that you've had from your decades of work? I think my favorite one in the book is, um, and I have several of them. So the way that I wrote this book different than any other book is the multidimensional facet. So multidimensional means that I can get information from other timelines. I can get it from other past lives, future lives. I can get it from all kinds of places. And throughout the book, I put pertinent um, actual client session stories in there. So one of them, when I'm talking about timelines and crossing timelines, was when I was privy to go down to Deadwood with a paranormal team that I did work with. And we got to go into a space to do an investigation uh, that was in a space on the top of like, um, almost like a strip mall all the way down, you know, two story uh, mm -hmm. building all the way down Deadwood on Main Street. And it was a live brothel all the way from the late 1800s, all the way up into almost the 1960s, 70s, and pushing towards the 80s. It was still an actual brothel. Mm. But when we went in, it was completely destroyed and destructed. It had paint on the walls, spray paint. Kids had vandalized. There was nothing in there. And we started out with just some ghost box stuff and looking around, and we were getting really great activity. And within seconds, I knew nothing about this building. And within seconds, my whole entire experience turned into a holographic timeline jump. And as I looked around this absolutely naked building of sorts, I could see the wallpaper on the wall. I could see from the 1800s. I could see the actual carpet. I could know what the furniture looked like. As I walked from room to room, I knew which prostitute was in which one. I knew the 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 main one or the big one, <laughs> the, the star of the show was in this one, whereas the novices were over here. I knew where the money was. I knew where the madam was. And it was just the most extraordinary thing. I knew where they were doing really horrific things to some of the women because the pain was palpable. Um, it was amazing. But the coolest part of the story is prior that day, I met a woman who had actually, she was about my age. She had actually been dropped off at that brothel when she was three years old. And she still lived in the town today. And I got to meet her earlier that day. And when I was having this experience, we FaceTimed her. And she was validating so much of what I was getting all the way down to where the couch was and what it looked like in the corner. I mean, it was extraordinary to be able to have complete validation from a person that was physically in that space for very many years. 
And then even more amazing, she jumped in a cab and came over and physically walked the space with us. And she had not been in that building since she was five or six years old. And she was in her late 50s. And it was the most beautiful evening of her remembering. She would stop at certain places because she was then back into her childlike self. Like, I can't cross that line. That's not where I get to go. We watched such transformation in her. It was the most amazing, amazing experience I've ever had. And she allowed us to share that completely in this book. So it's it's really written pretty much in depth in this book. But boy, that timeline was just crazy. All the way down to remembering people's names, what they looked like, what the furniture looked like, all the way down to a peekaboo window. Mm. I mean, it was nuts. Now, you used to also work in hospice. I think you were a hospice nurse. How did that work out with being an empath and being in that field? Yeah, I've never been a nurse. I was only a hospice volunteer. And I was only um, working in end of life. I, I wasn't the kind of hospice person that chatted and visited. I would only come in when they were transitioning. And because I do what I do, I could assist them in shutting down their energy fields. That doesn't mean you kill somebody. That means that you assist the actual movement of the aura, the energy, the fuel, the consciousness to alleviate anything that's blocking them from having a flow of an easy death. And so again, being the empath, I could tap into their body. And if they weren't moving in their solar plexus, for example, what happens, Jeff, is the chakra spins. And when we're living, it spins nice and great to give us that fuel. But during the death process, it slows and it slows and it slows because the gas stops and it dissipates. And then the field that holds that in the aura dissipates and they both dissolve. So I would be able to go in and feel why is this stagnant? What's wrong? And then I could telepathically get the information. Oh, I'm still harboring anger for so-and-so, or I'm scared to leave my daughter, or I don't want to leave my home. So I could do all of that work because I could merge into their field energetically and telepathically. So I would help them cross like seriously fast because it just merged. Did you ever have any shared death experiences with these people and actually cross over with them? I never crossed over with them, but I did get to the highest level I've ever done with a really beautiful friend of mine that I wrote a huge client story in the, that first book. The Energy Healer's Book of Dying brings you through those actual steps. And his story is in there. His, his name is Rick. I have permission on him. He was a wonderful man that I worked with throughout his cancer journey. And at one healing, I went all the way, all the way through the process into the light, all the way back to the sound of harmonics where that string sound that they say is something that you've never heard before. The music is so beautiful. The light is so clear. And I describe the reason why you go through a tunnel. It's your silver cord that's attached to your heart. This carries your actual mandala or energetic file, your Akashic record. All of those are interchangeable words. This is the tunnel that you go through. And the light at the end of the tunnel is your soul God source light. And so we do go through a tunnel. And the reason why we have a life review is because we're going through our Akash. So I got to go through half of his Akash. I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and I heard that I heard the actual harmonics. It was staggering. It was the most amazing thing. And when I came back out of that, I was so, I was so gone out of my body in that period that I remembered everything. And I came back and I was like seriously touching my own body going, I'm here, right? I am back, right? <laughs> so it was it was pretty insane. <laughs> Are you saying that the action of going through the tunnel is the spirit or soul leaving the body or it's already left the body and it's going from this realm to another realm? In my opinion, when I see things, we have what's called the silver cord. The silver cord is an etheric energy cord that goes from our heart chakra. And even Greg Braden talks about there's a cord or a bumper here that science can find only so far out. Our science can't see farther out for this cord, actually, in my opinion, goes all the way up to your higher self. So that when I'm in this incarnation as Suzanne, I am tethered to my higher source energy via this silver cord. This is where we traverse when we dream. I go to 4D through this cord. I return back into my body through this cord. So this is my own personal portal of sorts. Within that cord in energy is our Akashic personal record. And so we're constantly adjusting the Akash for my personal record as I'm going through life. But when I finally leave that body and I traverse back to my soul, that Akashic record is locked in as my book of life. 
And then I traverse up into my oversoul and I pull that cord out of that actual body in energy. And it resides for me. This is how I see it as a psychic, as a tentacle that's attached to that oversoul. So it kind of looks like a sea urchin. It has all the little, or a sunshine, a stick, a stick man with a sunshine. These little tentacles are how I read people as a psychic medium. I go into that cord. I go into that tentacle and I can read their Akashic record in there. So that's how I see it. It goes through the cord. They see the life review because it's there. It's a tunnel. The light's at the end of the tunnel because that's their oversoul. So you're saying that the the tunnel is traveling through the cord. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. That's how I experience it whenever mm -hmm. I do the work. So mm -hmm. if I'm helping somebody cross, I can move them into that tunnel. I can work with them. If I'm shutting someone's body down in a hospice situation, I assist to release the silver cord. We know when the body leaves itself, the cord releases. And I just see that cord release and go retract into a smaller tentacle version that is adhered to that oversoul. That's the actual symbolism that I get when I do that work. So when you read somebody's Akashic records, you're not going to some place in another realm that's, you know, like a Greek or Romanesque place. You're kind of just connecting with the soul at some level and getting it directly from the soul. I do both. It depends on what the process is and why I want to help them. If I want to clear ancestral lines, I'll go to that oversoul and I'll check each tentacle and see what applies. Okay. Other times I will go to the full Akash. And in my opinion, again, the reason why we see it Greek or Romanesque is that's simply pillaring light. The reason why we see the columns and we see it as a library with big columns is because it's a gridding of the light into the grids. It's a structuring of the light to pillar it so that it can contain the information and then I can go into it. That's why we see it as pillared. Mm, wow. The Akasha work is so important, you know, Especially when you're an empath, if I can just jump in and explain that, sure. why the Akash is so important for an empath to understand is humans will bring in their own perception of things. Oh my goodness, I'm so sad and I'm so upset. He or she died too young. She didn't get to be a mother. She didn't get to have children. And me in my work says she didn't sign up for children or to be married, or she would have had that to come to fruition in her record, in her Akash. Her Akash her own personal record only had her on this planet till X amount. That's part of the deal. And her contracts, her soul contracts with those people that she's involved with, she's leaving children, she's left her family, whatever, they are also co-contracted. So when an empath that is not confident and understanding that this is part of the overall process of divine, they can take on sadness for years and years and years for someone's pain, their cancer journey, their death. They can take on so much misery when it isn't theirs to even hold in the first place. It's like we jump into somebody else's sandbox and start playing with their toys because we think that we want to help them, but it actually steps on their journey. Then it probably would be a good thing if the empath could also read the Akashic records before they start empathing. Or I don't even think you have to have the ability to psychically read a record. I think it's just honor. It's the same thing that people do with death. You just honor the fact that that higher self of that person has finished their mission on earth and they are led by a higher source energy. They know exactly what they're doing. It may not look like it down here in 3D, but from their higher source energy, from their God source, from their connection to their oversoul, it's all contracted. And if we could just let go of that, see what we do is, is we bring it back to us. I'm the one that's upset that you're dead. I'm the one that's going to miss you. I'm the one that's sad you didn't have grandkids and so forth. Yeah, it's always about us. <laughs> well, that's what the empath does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the word honor is a really big deal when you get into energy. And the first book too, when you die and you don't have an honor around that from others, it can be very difficult to lose someone. But if you know in your heart of hearts that this is aligned to their higher self that they've got stuff to do their soul has other missions this is a this is a transitionary thing right we can change the way that we look at everything and we can live in joy instead of sadness and fear and guilt the subtitle of your book says a complete guide to multi-dimensional emptying what is empathing. that empathing. oh em oh empathing okay yeah. so when an empath takes on energy like we said you can take it on from anything let's go back to the brothel for a second just think if that got sold on the real estate market, 
somebody slapped a whole bunch of pretty paint on it and threw in an insurance company, right? Don't fool yourself that those people are going to feel the pain and the agony of that whole holographic situation unless somebody clears that. They're never going to know it if they don't understand this. They're never going to understand why all of a sudden they feel sick or sad. They don't know why their stomach hurts if they're in the room where horrific things were happening. They don't understand any of that. And yet this energy transference is happening all day long. This is a real thing. There's another actual um, story in here about the Hinkley fire. Again, I'm from Minnesota and the Hinkley fire is pretty, pretty big thing. And I had a preacher who had us come and do his church, but his home was on the land and everybody in the area has breathing problems. That's because they were all in the holographic fire for years and years and years. They all had all kinds of breathing problems. And so we can change this when we go in and we change the blueprint of the reality. We don't have to have that overlay. We don't have to have that actual angst and sickness and sometimes disease laying in the ethers that affects us in real time. Can you be empathic with other beings besides humans, like pets? A hundred percent. And actually pets are a really great thing to bring up because pets are kind of like a flash drive for the human. The pet will empath you and take your pain and agony. And oftentimes when the pet leaves the planet, it's because you energetically and emotionally are at a place for transition. And it doesn't make it any easier to lose our pet, right? But they empath 100%. So my suggestion to people all the time is clear your pet. Clear your pet just like you're going to clear yourself. And I give really detailed information on how to clear this stuff out of your body because we want to get it out of our body and back to that Akashic source energy. We want the information to go to the library. And you ask why? It's because in between lives, when that next incarnation comes in, we want that information made privy to them when they're making their choice to come into an embodiment. If I know the forest feel pain because we're pillaging them. If I know that the fish and the coral are miserable, I may indeed come in as that scientist that changes things. It's hmm. the information that's important. Can you also read something like the planet itself? The planet itself is huge to be able to empath. And again, we've had lots and lots of tragedy on our planet. We've had wars, we've had pillage, we've had you know, cracking open and look at things like hurricanes and tsunamis and people are like, oh my gosh, that's so horrible. Yes, it is, but it is a healing mechanism. It brings balance. It brings love. It raises the vibration. So the planet is actually very adept at releasing her pain, but we can also assist. And this is part of the human's mission, in my opinion. Well, there are a lot of earth changes going on right now. Are you able to see like the future of what's going to happen with the earth? I don't think if anyone gave you a future prediction right now, I would be very leery of that because I don't think we know because we haven't created it yet. There technically is so many timelines interpenetrating right now. And every single solitary human being is putting into the collective field their own fuel, whether that's fear or that's love. We have been trained for eons to put fear into it. So now we're starting to wake up and go, oh my goodness, I can actually look at this differently and I can clear up my own house, meaning my body, my life, my mission, my everything. And that changes that collective quotient into more love-based if I'm more love-based. So people go, well, I'm just a little person. I can't change the world. And I say, the heck you don't. You do it all day long because every one of us is a shard in that collective field that is prismatically changing the quotients all day long. Are you still in contact with the ETs and the galactics? Yeah, actually, I do a lot of on-ship work. I do have one very close practitioner friend who is also very what we would ca call alien, but it's not my favorite word, um, more galactic. And when we do body work on each other, we will oftentimes astral project and our bodies are down here in my healing room while our other bodies like the general and she's a chiropractor down here and on ship she's also a doctor so i tease her a lot that i call the one on ship doctor doctor mm -hmm. because that's the higher level of the doctor so we're down here and we can energetically telepathically see us working up here at the same time simultaneously and it's been pretty fascinating work and that's been quite a, probably six years at least now we do that quite often if a person's absorbing too much negative energy or fear how do they move that throughout their body 
that's a really, really great skill set to learn. Doesn't matter what level of the empath you are. If you're a generic general one, if you are a sensitive one, and especially if you're a psychic one, it is a process. And so again, this starts with understanding the, the faculties of my body, what my body feels like, how intimate am I with my own resonance? This comes through quiet time. And, you know, people are always like, you have to meditate. Well, I have been doing this for almost 20 years and I don't meditate every day, but I do tap into my body constantly. I'm very present with feeling my boundaries. And so I'm always aware that, gosh, I walked into something. That's because I spend time on envisioning my bubble. So we call it the ground in the bubble. And that whole meditation is in the book. And plus, by the way, I have a free one on my website on the homepage. You can just download it on your phone. It's a short version. But a ground and bubble basically is this. You bring in heart-centered light into your middle chakra, your fourth chakra, your heart, and you bring half of it down into the earth, walk into Mother Earth, anchor that, bring it back. Other half goes to Father Sky, anchor that, bring it back. And then you burst a bubble of love, light, and protection around you so that you're magnetically and electrically grounded, but I am also unique in my bubble. Then I start to work that bubble and I start to go, okay, I've got my bubble on. Now I can feel somebody's in the room. Somebody's angry. I walk through fear. This building has something in it. This is your discernment tool. So the ground in the bubble is great. How do you get good at the ground in the bubble? Meditative time and body scanning. Again, magic school bus. You don't have to do what I did, but to be able to just sit and say, gosh, you know, this is so tight all the time. What is this? If I had to question it. Is there a feeling? Is there a knowing? Is there a memory? Is there a trigger? And so the more time you spend with your feel centers in your own human body, the more intimate you are with what we would call your resonance or your frequency or your vibration. Then that helps when I find myself up against a vibration that is not of like, oh, that feels like fear or, oh, that feels like control. So this is the tools that start to give you some context and some boundaries, okay? So then what do we do if we actually took some on? This is the next step. I'm gonna sit with that body scan again. Oh my gosh, my heart feels so heavy. Oh, that's so weird. Is this mine? This is one of the chapters. Is this mine? Well, that's really weird. I don't think it's mine. Most humans will make it up in our head. That's silly. It's got to be mine. It doesn't have to be yours. Most of the time, it isn't yours. And the more that you can get your ego out of the way and play these games, is this mine? No, I trust it isn't mine. Whose is it? What is it? If I hear it's the trees, I don't want to go, oh, that's silly. That's ridiculous. It can't be the trees because sure as heck, it can be the trees or it can be the animal kingdom or it can be the water. It can be anything, right? Or it can be your mother. So if I discern, is this mine or not mine? That's the first steps. And then I give it more clarity. And then I feel it. Most people don't want to feel. Human beings are trained to think. We think feel. My suggestion as practitioners is to learn how to feel feel and trust your feels and go into your feels because most people want to get away from feeling. Oh, I'm sad. It's scary. That's bad. I don't want to feel it. Trust me, you're feeling it all day long. So you want to shine the light on it and go into the feel. Now I'm feeling the depth of the sadness. Oh my God, that's so crazy. The trees are so sad. They're being cut down. They're being ripped down. The storm really devastated this area and I can feel pain. So now what do I want to do with that? This is where the beauty of being individual comes in. I can do this any way I want to. I give suggestions in the book, but I push for be creative. You can put that thought feel on a dove and let it fly away. I can let the cloud take it. I can burn it up in a letter. I can, if I'm having sadness with my child, I can write them a heartfelt letter and burn it up and watch it go to the ethers and know it gets to them. There's a million, I can dance, I can wiggle, I can do anything, I can beat a drum. This is endless in creativity. What we're doing is releasing it from here so I stay open and clean. I send it back to that Akashic again because source energy needs to know we're hurting our forest or what it feels like to lose a child or what it feels like when I've been abandoned and so on and so on. So we want that information to get back home again so that these new incoming beings can start to progressively change our evolution of our species and our planet. All right. Wow. Thank you. It's a different form of prayer. It really is. 
And, you know, I grew up Catholic, Catholic and a little more Catholic. And my body as a child really resisted a lot of things like bow your head for God's blessing. And my little 10 year old head to go upward. And I do this because it was like, no, we're bigger than this. We're bigger than this. And so it was always about bringing it up, raising that vibration, bringing it upward. Prayer is about really releasing in non-controlling anybody else. Let them have their journey. If they're sick, they get to be sick. I can bring them cookies, but I don't want to fix them, right? They came here for a journey. So the empath can get really confused on what their job is. So I always suggest go back to what the bigger job is. Most of us forget we signed up for a planet. We're signed up for a planet or you wouldn't be here. You'd be sitting on, you know, a serious B. I mean, you're here on earth for a reason and figure out what that is and find joy and fuel that way. Do you even know what makes Jeff feel good? What in nature makes you feel just like, wow. Basically being in beautiful places in nature. Right. And can you get even deeper? Is it having to do with an element? Is it the wind? I think is it the water? Is it the rock? I guess you would say water, but not necessarily being in the water. Right. We would dub that in my world as a merman or a mermaid. The mm -hmm. merman and the mermaid loves the water, but I don't want to be in the depths of it. I want to be on the rock on the side, flipping my tail around in the sunshine. So it's a combination of a water element and an earth element. So if Jeff knows that this is something that makes your heart sing, this is love fuel. You can go down to the water and do that imagination of the merman and suck that in like fuel. I think I tell in this book that I literally, I'm air first and foremost, and I just like, I suck it in like an X-man. And I think I tell in this book that one time I was out in the middle of a storm and I went outside at like midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and I'm standing out in the backyard, just filling up like fuel, like crazy. Cause it's my favorite. And I coughed and I heard in the pitch black of my dark yard, mom. And I, I was like, what, what? And here's my son across the way doing the same exact thing in the dark, filling his soul up. Mm. I thought that was so great. So in the book, I wrote proud parenting moment. <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, if somebody wants to find out more about your books, do they find them on Amazon or your website? Yep, both. They're everywhere. So Barnes & Noble, Amazon, on my website. So everything that I have um, easily is just my name. So it's S-W-O-R-T-H-L-E-Y.com. And they can find out all the information on there. I teach some classes on that. Um, I will be revving up my tours again. I did tours to Peru every year. I kind of pulled back on that during you know, the, the pandemic time period, but we're ramping up again. Um, we do work in Sedona do a lot of online classes. I have a really great, awesome online community called Vibe Tribe. If people are out there that don't know too much about energy or can't connect the dots, and I can get really crazy in those webcasts that I do every month for those members. And that's a really awesome deal. And everything is right on my website. But I do encourage them to go to YouTube too. I do Instagram, our YouTube, um, our own little podcast. I told you we just started a couple months ago. It's called Energy Unleashed where we talk about energy every single time and they're kind of fun. And so, yeah, check it out. Everything's, everything's right on the site. Well, if someone wants to reach out to you and ask you questions, should they do that from your YouTube channel or your website? They can do it right from my website. There's a contact form on my website for asking questions. So they can just go directly into my website and they can fill out the contact form and ask questions there. All right, great. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah, I think why this book is so important is, is that we are ascending. We are changing. This planetary ascension process is happening. And in my opinion, we have the ability to ride that wave in a really great and positive way, which will push that process with ease and grace. We also have the opportunity to not do that. We can fight it. We can stay in that fear. We can ruminate on all the old stuff. But it's a heck of a lot more fun to ride the wave. And please, if you choose, don't judge your neighbor. Not everybody's going to want to do this. Not everyone's going to care. Not anyone. There's people that don't give two hoots about aliens or galactics because they think it's crazy. And that's okay. So if we can give everyone the space and the ability to hold their own truth and just worry about yours in terms, and don't even worry, by the way, just go into yours and get the feel inside of you is your validation versus outside of you. We're flipping this around as a universe, a planet, and as a species. And it is working. 
It's just if more people would do their personal work, we could do this faster and quicker and easier. Suzanne, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very, very honored to be here. I well, do. I appreciate it. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.